Okay, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to have today Marie Carmen Banyuz from the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics. Um, and she is an expert on tensor network methods for studying emergent phases of matter in many body quantum systems, but also in their applications to uh, classical systems out of equilibrium. And, and uh, well, she will tell us all about it. So the floor is yours. So. So thank you very much. So thanks, first of all, for the invitation. It's uh, very nice to be able to tell you about this, uh, this work that we have been doing in the last, uh, yeah, last few years. And well, thank you all for <laughs> attending the talk. And I have to uh, start with a disclaimer that I'm not expert at all in, in uh, statistical mechanics or, or these classical systems. And this is something that I started in collaboration with, uh, with some uh, other people a few years ago. And we found that it is very interesting um, way of using distance on our tools. Although my, yeah, my main line of work is more related to the uh, standard uses of tensor networks for quantum many body systems. So today I want to tell you about this, this uh, yeah, a couple of different lines of work that are more related to, to these classical systems, but they also have, uh, of course, uh, things in common with our uh, more usual algorithms. So I will try to give you a bit of an overview of um, what these tensor networks uh, are and uh, why they are really useful for classical systems. And this is not something new. This is, this is probably older than any of our quantum algorithms, but also what are these uh, sort of newer applications that we have been uh, working on recently uh, in the last years for these non-equilibrium uh, classical systems. And this is, I, I showed their names before, I didn't say them explicitly. This is mainly driven by this collaboration with uh, Juan Garrahan and his student Luke Kauser in, in Nottingham. And uh, also the other part of the, of the work has been done in collaboration mainly with Sofia Nibristir in, in Barcelona, David Perez García in Madrid, and Miguel Frias, who is a student in here. I will sort of uh, yeah, specify it later. But uh, I mean, most of my talk will probably be about these constraint models that are, so where the real experts are, are Juan Garrahan and his, and his group. So, yeah, first of all, I want to tell you, I mean, this, this general ideas. I know that some of you are very expert in, on this, but um, what these tensor networks are. And, and uh, we always use this pictorial representation to talk about net tensor network calculations and algorithms. And uh, just to, uh, to, to show, I mean, to give you the feeling of how this, this works, I have these two introductory slides, although most of my talk today is very descriptive about what we can do with them rather than the algorithms themselves. But at least there are some of these pictures so that you know what they mean. So a tensor for us is really just a multidimensional array. So graphically, this is an object with a number of legs, and this number of legs corresponds to the number of dimensions. So for instance, each of these legs in here uh, would correspond to one index. And if we fix like all the indices, this would be one component. And all the components of the object would be the whole tensor. So that's like one tensor for us. Of course, an example is a matrix, which just has two legs, two indices. And well, in all these pictures, there is no uh, unique convention as to how to uh, choose the direction of the indices. Sometimes in the, in the context of describing the algorithms and so on, there is a little bit of meaning associated to that, but uh, you can just, for the moment, forget about that. The indices can be placed in wherever you want. But sometimes we, for instance, for a matrix, we place them like this, opposite uh, sides of, on, on a box. Then, of course, a matrix has two clearly uh, defined dimensions. But of course, you can vectorize it. And I mean, the tensor object is still the same in a way. So op operations that you can do with tensors is contracting them which means taking a product over a common shared index. I mean, of course, the, again, the simplest example is to take the product graph matrices, which graphically is represented as it shows in here, like you have a common leg that joins both tensors, and this simply represents this kind of operation. So uh, tensor numbers have appeared many times in the literature, actually, but um, for, for like the kind of um, uh, work I'm doing and the kind of applications that we are most familiar with, they are really um, important in the context of quantum many body systems. And the way they, they can be introduced there, or the most intuitive way of seeing what, what they are in this context, is that of describing the state of such a system. So we have a system which is uh, made out of, say, capital N uh, individual quantum systems, and each of them could be a spin one half particle or a qubit. So it has a finite dimension. You have several of them, and they have some patterns of interactions. They interact with each other in some way. And we are interested in, in uh, describing what is, say, the ground state or, or the thermal equilibrium state. Mm, and uh, of course, uh, 
in an exact way, this is uh, exponentially costly, and this is where the tensor networks come in. Well, I, I must say, because the talk is uh, also about non-equilibrium, that, well, equilibrium states are, uh, of course, very fundamental, but we are interested in going beyond that. We would also like to, to be able to say things about our dynamics. So let's say we want to describe interesting states, physically relevant states of such a system. So if we want to do that exactly, we just write a basis for our system. We take the individual basis of each of our individual quantum systems. And uh, so, so one second. Okay, yes. Uh, so we, we take an individual basis for each of each of uh, our systems, and we write the coefficients of each of the of each of the terms in this basis. And uh, again, if we look at this coefficient, this is a thing with n uh, indices. So this is an, a tensor with n legs. And well, the number of dimensions is, of course, as I said, exponential with the, with the system size. The idea is that instead of considering the most general uh, coefficients in here that have this exponential cost, we can restrict our, our search to, uh, to families of states where you, we just have a polynomial number of parameters in the number of constituents. And this is what tensor networks do. So basically, the idea is that instead of uh, considering the most general coefficient in here, we consider coefficients which have some structure in terms of a tensor network. So we have smaller tensors, then fewer parameters, and they are contracted in some particular pattern that defines the properties of our family. And, and that gives you an, uh, families of states that can be dealt with uh, efficiently because they only have a, a polynomial number of parameters. So an interesting um, way of thinking of uh, about tensor networks is actually uh, thinking of these local uh, small tensors as local pieces that you use to build up collective states and actually define a lot of the properties of the of the whole system. So this is a, a very fruitful also way of of thinking of the topic and, and that gives um, a lot of say formal uh, formal results or mathematical results. So of course the first question is. Is this, isn't this too, too rough, right? So too, too much of a simplification. And of course, it's a big one because we go from the exponentially large Hilbert space to families which are only polynomial in size. And the, the reason why this works uh, for, for the cases we are interested in is that we are not interested in describing any state at random in the Hilbert space. If we would just say this is a cartoon picture of the Hilbert space and you just fish one state out of, out of there at random, this is a very entangled state. It's very far from product states. So product states are just a very small set of the Hilbert space and uh, a random state is very far from them. But the kind of states that we are interested in are not so far from product states. So product states are already the kind of functions that we have in, in mean field theory. They are already enough to give us some of the interesting physics of many of the problems we are interested in. So what we are interested in is going beyond that. So states that appear naturally or that are physically relevant, as I was saying before, and these are not random states in the Hilbert space. And, uh, and people uh, talk about this saying that we are interested in a particular corner of the Hilbert space, which is this physically relevant uh, part of it. And of course, what is the interesting property? What is the relevant property to define that? Well, it turns out that a very uh, significant property that allows us to do all this, uh, this efficient representation is the entanglement. And uh, more concretely, the fact that the states that we are looking at or we are looking for have little entanglement. So um, a more uh, rigorous way of, of saying that uh, is um, uh, in terms of the area law. So actually, for local, uh, so for, for ground states of local Hamiltonians, we expect that the ground state satisfy what is called an area law of entanglement, meaning that if you take your uh, whole system and split it in two parts, take a partition and ask yourself how much entanglement you have between one part and the other, if you would do that in a random uh, state, well, the, the size of the entanglement, the, the amount of entanglement that you can have uh, grows with the number of sites that you have in, in one part of your system. And this is what, what we would call a volume law because it's like the number of points you have inside. However, in this kind of states, what you have is an area law, uh, which tells us that the entanglement only grows with the number of, uh, so the size of the boundary. So how big is the connection between one bipartition and the other? And this is, of course, much smaller than the maximum amount of entanglement. And this tends to be a key property of these uh, ground states. So, um, mathematically speaking, this uh, property has been demonstrated rigorously for one-dimensional systems when the, local, so the Hamiltonian is local and has a, a gap. But um, it is uh, found to be true for um, like 
most interesting cases or most uh, known cases uh, in in uh, higher dimensions too, even with with uh, fewer restrictions. Although in two dimensions, it's not proven. And in one dimension, it's also known how this is violated uh, when the the conditions of the theorem are not true. Actually, when you have a critical system, so the gap condition is not met, you have more entanglement than that. But it's still a small correction. It's only logarithmic in the size of your partition, which is, which is still saying that even if the system is critical, the amount of entanglement is very small. And actually, there's also an area law for uh, thermal states, so thermal equilibrium states, not ground states. This was true for the ground states. Well, but even if you are looking at uh, finite temperature, then there is actually a rigorous area law for local Hamiltonians at any finite temperature. So this is sort of the, the one of the key ideas to construct uh, interesting assets in the form of tensor networks, because uh, if we can uh, write families that already um, include this property, then at least we know that they are uh, capturing the right amount of entanglement. And you are, we are parameterizing states with the right amount of entanglement. And this is sort of a very important piece of uh, understanding how things work. But um, tensor networks uh, are, uh, so they, they come in different families, right? So I'm not talking about all of them now. I just want to mention that this is the case, but I'm focusing on the ones that precisely satisfy this area law that I was talking uh, about by construction. And, and these are uh, matrix product states, which are like the best known uh, example of tensor networks, and then the generalization to high dimensions, which is uh, PEPs. So matrix product states in this generic picture that I was showing before, are uh, a family where instead of considering uh, coefficients that have this generic uh, structure, like the tensor with all the legs, so the tensors that we consider have a structure where uh, we have one individual tensor per site in the system, and they are connected to uh, one next tensor and one next tensor and so on, uh, forming like a chain. So you have one tensor per site, and each tensor holds, say, one of the physical indices, which was one of the indices in the, in the basis, and then what happens is that, it is that if you compute the coefficient in any state of the basis of this kind of state, what you have is a product of tensors which have up to two indices because you will be fixing the value, say, of the physical indices. And then it's a product of matrices, and this is where the name comes from. So the coefficients are products of matrices. You can make it. Can I, can I make a uh, sorry, yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, um, so just trying to understand. So, so the idea is when you have this expansion, you want to. You wanna, I mean, you don't wanna sum over the whole hyperspace, you just wanna sum over a little corner. Mm -hmm. the structure with the tensor network states is what gives you like the meaningful physical corner where you wanna sum. Is this, is this correct? Okay, so that's what we hope, right? That that we have the right family. So that by using these parametrizations, you are actually exploring precisely the interesting region of uh, of the Hilbert space. In 1D, it is quite the case. In 2D, the mathematical results are not so close. There are still open questions about the, the formalism of PEPs, but, um, but I mean, there are already very good arguments why we expect that this is actually a very good parametrization to approximate the kind of equilibrium states, at least, that we expect to have in uh, so for local Hamiltonian. So yes, in a sense, we are, um, so one way of looking at this is that these are tools to explore this physically, um, physically relevant part of the Hilbert space. And there are a number of mathematical results that uh, allow us to argue that they are act actually the right parametrization in some, in some sense. So yes, this is, this is sort of the goal. But then, of course, you can also take the, the say, a practical point of view and say, we have a number of, of algorithms to work with that numerically. And then we can use it for many problems where uh, our space has the structure of this kind of tensor product. And, and this is actually what we are doing in, in some of the things that I will show you uh, later. But I want to give you also a bit of a uh, so justification why we are so convinced that this is a useful uh, thing to study and, and all the things that we have understood about them uh, that come from the quantum uh, part. So I hope this is more or less answering your question. Yes, thanks. Okay, thank you. So yeah, so what I was saying is that the matrix product states is really the, the, the best understood uh, family. And, and there's a lot of mathematical uh, results about uh, 
why they are good approximations to ground states of local Hamiltonians and what are the properties, what are the properties under symmetries and uh, so a lot of uh, a lot of understanding of the of the family and a lot of it comes actually from quantum information or from the interface between quantum information and quantum many body many body physics. So I, uh, as I said, this is one of the families that satisfies the area law by construction. And uh, in particular in 1D, the area law tells us that if we split our system in two parts, uh, the amount of entanglement that uh, we can have between both partitions cannot scale with the size of one of the of the regions, but it's uh, upper bounded by something which goes like a constant because the boundary in that case is only one side, it's only one cut. And this is actually what uh, matrix product states will feel, and this bound is given by the uh, logarithm of the size of these matrices that appear in the ansatz, and this is what we call the bond dimension. So going to higher dimensions, uh, the matrix product states have a natural generalization, and, and this is called uh, PEPS, so projected entangled per state. And uh, well, I, I'm only showing the picture, but uh, you have a real expert there, which is Philip, and you can ask him about all the details about working with, uh, with this uh, family. So I, I hope that the picture is clear. Instead of having like a one-dimensional uh, network, you have a two-dimensional one. And I'm jumping uh, over a number of details because actually you could use matrix flag states also to describe a two-dimensional system. But the answer itself is one-dimensional, right? It has some one-dimensional structure and you can go uh, beyond that and construct a high-dimensional one. And of course you can do this on any arbitrary uh, lattice and construct PEPs for any arbitrary lattice. And the good thing is that Although with much more uh, difficulty from the point of view of uh, so computational point of view, and also from the mathematical point of view, they are harder uh, beasts to, to deal with. But uh, in practice, we can work with many, so the, the algorithms that I'm describing next, we can also apply them to these higher dimensional, uh, these higher dimensional answers. And the logic is the same, sort of. So if you understand how this works, then uh, then at least you, you have the idea how it works in general for any of these um, any of these families. So the basic algorithms that we can work with uh, in a simplified manner, we could say that there are two kinds of things that we can do with these uh, with these um, families. One of them is to use them to optimize the so to, to try to find variationally the ground state. So we try to optimize the energy over the family of uh, say matrix block states or perhaps if we are doing higher dimension. So we have a Hamiltonian which is local in some sense and uh, local, uh, let's say that it can be written also as a tensor network itself. And this is not a too restrictive uh, condition. We can also go beyond local Hamiltonians using some tricks that we have like in the toolbox. But um, say that we have a Hamiltonian that we can write as a, as a tensor uh, network. In this case, what is drawn in here looks like an MPS, and because it's an operator, I would say this is a matrix product operator, so an MPO. And we want to find an approximation to the ground state with the form of a matrix product state. So this is an uh, algorithm that we can, so we know very well, it's really the DMRG algorithm, uh, that is like the most uh, up-to-date way of dealing with strongly correlated one-dimensional systems. And actually you can see that it is, uh, it can be re-expressed, uh, as looking over the family of matrix product states for the one that minimizes the energy. And this can be used to find ground states and excitations. And of course, you can use this same algorithm to optimize other quantities that have a similar form. So this is one like big piece, uh, one big uh, 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 role in our toolbox. And then another thing that we can do is to apply local or not so local operators, so operators that have this matrix product operator or, or some of them, or Pepo in the case of Pepsi structure, and apply them on a state that has the same form and, and find the, the result in the same family. So this can be done uh, to, so this can be used to simulate an evolution, but uh, it can also be done to find ground states and to find thermal states. And uh, I mean, to do sort of linear algebra algorithms, actually. So graphically, this will be the picture. So you have something that looks like an uh, MPS at the beginning, you apply something that looks like an MPO, and then you find the approximation. And in principle, all these things you could do also in higher dimensions. But uh, sometimes this might not be uh, the most uh, uh, yeah, easy uh, thing to do, but I'm not going into the details of how to deal with one or the other. So there are other ways to do time evolution, which do not uh, really 
uh, fit into this simplified picture, but it's also not so important for what I'm uh, saying next. So uh, up to now, I only talked about these applications for quantum systems and why these are interesting and why this is justified and so on. But uh, these strong correlations also appear in classical systems. And uh, if you're interested about the, the history of this, I, I think I would recommend very much to listen to some of uh, Tomotoshi Nishino's talks. And uh, he's been given lecture, uh, lectures on, on this topic in several places. And the last one I can't remember is in the last edition of Penasque. And I think the talk is probably available online. And, and he has a very nice uh, overview of where these tensor networks started appearing already in the context of uh, classical uh, statistical mechanical uh, systems. And um, sorry, okay. <laughs> and uh, the, the idea how they appear there uh, is that we can also use tensor networks not to describe states, but to describe something else. And in particular, when you write the partition function of a classical spin system, this you can write as a tensor network, as the result of contracting a tensor network. And then you can uh, say that the problem now is not approximating a quantum state, it's not describing the state of a quantum system, but is to find the contraction of this quantity, which is a partition function. And of course, observables also can be, can be put in this form. And uh, there are different ways of, of doing that. And one of the most popular ones is uh, the whole family of, of methods that, uh, that are called tensor renormalization group approaches. And roughly speaking, what they, what they do is to coarse grain this lattice by contracting a few of these tensors together and finding a new description or approximation to the result with a smaller number of tensors and iterate this procedure until you find some, uh, some uh, so estimate of the, of the partition function or the quantity that you, want to, that you want to find. And well, as I said, this has been um, developed by many people. There are many different approaches, but, but this is sort of the uh, common idea. And uh, again, although this is a contraction of a partition function, it's not, there's no quantum state in here. This can be done for classical systems, also for some quantum systems. Of course, you can also write uh, some, some quantum systems as uh, classical systems in one high dimension and apply, uh, apply these tricks. But uh, there is no quantum state in there intrinsically that we are trying to describe with the tensor network. Tensor network is now doing something else, but still, there is this concept of entanglement in the tensor network that, uh, or generalized concept of entanglement, if you want, that uh, determines when these approximations are good or not, or what, is, what kind of correlations actually you are able to describe or are making your life uh, difficult. So um, as, as I said, this is one use of, of tensor networks, which goes beyond the, the quantum state. And the thing is that when you do these contractions, this kind of coarse graining, uh, you also have to decide how big the tensors are that you, you can keep as you try to approximate, iterate uh, your, your contraction. And it turns out that depending on the scenario, depending on the situation, you might need a very large one dimension. And this, of course, makes your uh, whole calculation more costly. So, uh, so one thing that I just want to explain briefly is one way that, that I have been working on to, to uh, use tensor networks for this classical situation is actually combining both ideas like a more uh, standard uh, approach to this um, uh, summing of partition functions is using some kind of Monte Carlo uh, algorithm. So it turns out that you can combine uh, this kind of uh, Monte Carlo something with um, say tensor network contraction approach to find efficient ways of sampling over this kind of classical uh, Boltzmann distribution for a classical spin system. And the idea is that if this is what we want to do, so instead of just doing once the contraction of the tensor network and finding the partition function, we would like to do a Sina Monte Carlo algorithm sample from the configurations in a way that corresponds to the Boltzmann probabilities. And we know that these Boltzmann probabilities are encoded really in this tensor network that, uh, that I drew before, because this is exact. So this is really the, the partition function. So what we want to do is to, to uh, uh, say, device a sampling scheme where we start with some configuration, propose a move, and accept with some probability. And, and uh, so we have a, a metropolis step. And uh, what we um, sort of include in this, or the factors that we uh, 
that we include in here are the, the prior uh, probability distribution. So what is the probability to pick a new configuration starting from a certain one? And, and then what is the probability of my new configuration uh, according to the, the one I want to sample, right? And then uh, if I do this step and, and my, um, so my, my chain is reducible, so I'm able to sample over, so eventually sample all the configurations, this will, this, this will converge to the true distribution, even if I'm uh, sampling using something different. But of course, ideally, what I would like to, to have is uh, uh, prior that samples close to the true distribution because then I would accept most of the time, right? And this is precisely what we can achieve by combining this uh, tensor network uh, strategy. So the idea is very simple, is the following. So as I said before, the partition function is really written as a tensor network. There is, at this point, no approximation. So this is the partition function for some temperature. So the probability of a given, uh, of a given configuration, so for each of the spins in the network, which now are labeled from zero to n, but this is just completely uh, arbitrary. So I can just uh, number them. So I just choose some order. So I can uh, write the, the probability of a given configuration as a product of the probability of uh, the, the spin value for the first, first spin, say, uh, times the conditional probability of the second one, condition to this value of the first one, and so on. And it turns out that each of these terms in there, I can actually uh, write as a, as a ratio of a contraction of a partition function. For instance, the, the first one would be the ratio between the partition function, where I have uh, some number of the spins except for the first one, so the first one is fixed uh, to the value i zero, and, and the others are not. So the others are just some overall possible values. And then I divide by the total partition function, and this gives me precisely the probability that the first spin is uh, at the value i zero. So this is this um, probability, right? So I'm just fixing one and, and dividing by the total probability. And so on. So I can just do that by fixing two and fixing three and, and dividing by the previous one. And it turns out that each of these terms where I just fix one or several spins is still a tensor network that I can contract using tensor network uh, contractions. And this could be TRG approaches or it could be uh, something using the MPS and PO uh, algorithm that I was showing before. Uh, so we would call it a boundary contraction maybe. Um, but uh, the, what we get in this way is that we have an approximated probability distribution that comes from the approximations that we do in the contraction. So we can, so okay, I, I said that we can approximate these probability distributions and we can actually sample according to them. So we can sample each of the spins according to these probabilities that we can compute efficiently. And then we have something which is not quite the right probability distribution, but is close to that. And to correct for the, for the uh, non uh, uh, say correctness of the, of the probability from which we are sampling, then we have a metropolis Hastings uh, step. And then even if our approximation to the contractions is not very good, because we are doing this metropolis Hastings, we will converge to the right probability uh, distribution. So we will be sampling, our final sample will have the right uh, distribution according to the Boltzmann distribution that we had at the beginning. And, and the nice thing is that because you can afford to do this with not quite precise contractions of the tensor networks, we can, you can afford to do it with small bond dimensions. So with a certain error in the contraction, you can do this efficiently for two or higher dimensions, which is typically where the problem is. If, I mean, this, this contraction of the tensor network is, it should work very well, but if you need to increase your bond dimension, your costs go up very, very fast, especially if you want to go to three dimensions. Uh, but in here, the, the trick is that even doing a cheap contraction, you can still find something which has a rejection rate, which, which is not very large. And these are some examples of easing models in three dimensions. So in here, uh, and this is work that, that was main, mainly done by Miguel Frias, a PhD student here, who was before in Barcelona uh, with Sofiane Blisdir. And, and he was computing precisely uh, easing models in three dimensions. Um, he did many cases. I'm just showing here a couple of the examples just to give you the, the feeling of what comes out. So these are ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic uh, cases with a, with a field. And um, because these are finite uh, systems, we are not seeing really the critical point. So the horizontal axis is temperature and the dashed lines indicate where the critical point is at, uh, so the critical temperature is at, at uh, in the infinite limit. 
in thermodynamic limit. But what you can see here is the rejection rate using contractions with different precision in the tensor, so with the different sizes of the tensor. So the different colors, uh, starting in blue and going up towards the red, make contractions that are more and more precise and more and more costly also. But what you can see in here is that, okay, the rejection rate decreases when you have better contractions, which is expected because you have a better approximation to the true uh, probability distribution. But even if it is very rough, if, if you have like bond dimension two, which is very cheap, your rejection rate is far from one. So you can still iterate, have more samples, and the thing will converge because you have this Metropolis Hastings uh, step, and you, it will converge to the, um, to the true distribution. So uh, even uh, though near criticality, this rejection rate increases and things become uh, more difficult, you still have a sampling that produces the, the, right, uh, the right results. And well, you can use a very simple contraction scheme. We didn't explore really uh, what is the most efficient, the most uh, op the optimal choice here, the trade-off between the complication and so on. We just used a very simple one. And uh, yeah, and, and this just demonstrates that this works uh, pretty well. So it's a, a nice way of combining. So the power of tensor networks with the advantages of having a Metropolis Hastings uh, step that, uh, that gives you some guarantees that even if you are doing something not completely correct, you will convert to the right uh, distribution. And of course you could ask, okay, but what if you put all the effort in contracting the tensor network? Right? So you could just try to do your contraction of the tensor network more, more efficient, so more, more precisely, put larger bond dimensions and, and just do the contraction one and then you have the partition function and, and that's what you wanted. And what you, we plot in here is the error as, uh, as you increase, say you do more and more uh, costly contractions with the tensor network. Again, the blue is the least costly one and the red the most costly one. And you can see that of course it depends on where uh, you are in temperature, but the purple, uh, diamonds are really the errors that you get as uh, you apply, apply our sampling method. And you can see that even with a very, this was done with a small bone dimension, even with a small bone dimension, your errors are much smaller and putting like a lot of more effort in the contraction of the tensor network. So this can be a, an interesting strategy to, uh, to have in mind to, to combine precisely this kind of uh, two different uh, tools. But this is about, uh, okay, yes, uh, just to mention, so I want to, to jump to the other topic, but I just uh, want to say that I just showed these examples for the AC model, but this is not restricted to, to this model. We actually did these calculations for many different situations, including uh, actually um, disorder models that have uh, so spin glass uh, behavior. And, and in that case, uh, you get like orders of magnitude, uh, faster equilibration than, than other just Monte Carlo algorithms that are uh, sort of um, optimized for that precise problem. So one, uh, one reason why this is true is that actually, thanks to the tensor network, when you update the configuration, you update all the spins, and this is a collective update. It's all the configuration is sampled according approximately to the true probability distribution of the many, many body uh, problem. It's not that you are flipping one spin and then maybe a few of them uh, a few more around, around it. You are just taking a, a whole new configuration, uh, which is selected according to something which is close or relatively close to the true distribution. Anyway, so one can also adapt the method to do something else, not, not spin model. You can, you can encode in the same way other kinds of models. So it uh, potentially could be useful for many, many other problems. So this is something that we are still, of course, uh, working on. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes, sir. Uh, so, so, so um, if I picture the tensor network that corresponds to, let's say, the uh, partition function of classical easing model mm -hmm. at some temperature, I would guess that for such a such a network, uh, the bond dimension is fixed. Yes. And 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 then in uh, when I want to contract that network, okay, there comes an additional uh, resource, let's say typically mm -hmm. boundary and boundary dimension and so on, which right. I guess is the chi you denote here. Uh, but then, like in these in these examples, you have the bond dimension d yes. and chi yes. that both change. So, yes. so where is the like very good? Way? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's because this is a three-dimensional case. So in the three-dimensional case, if you do this boundary contraction, 
you have like a three-dimensional network, so you can contract it with a PEPS that goes inside, right? And then when you are contracting the PEPS, uh, this has a one dimension of the boundary, which is, I think, in this plot, the D. But then at the end, you still have to contract a two dimensional. Uh, okay, I see. So uh, I there see. will be other ways of doing it, of course, if one was doing some TRG uh, algorithm or something like that. So this is not the unique way of parameterizing it. But in our case, this is what sort of controls the cost of the contractions. But yes, this is very good because I didn't give the details, but it, that's actually. The, the case. So in our case, we just want to, to show how things go when you increase the cost of your contraction. But yeah. there will be other ways of doing it. But yeah, yeah, this is a very good question. Thank you. Yes. OK, so I, uh, so I, I, I already told you about this way of using tensor networks for classical, for, for classical problems. But I said at the beginning that I, I was interested in non-equilibrium problems, uh, mainly. And, uh, so I actually want to talk for the rest of, so for the rest of the talk, I want to discuss how to use this for, for some uh, classical cases. But again, um, it's, uh, I think, interesting to, to see what is different in the, in the non-equilibrium problems in the quantum case. And uh, so in the quantum case, uh, one, we have time evolution algorithms. I said it at the beginning that we can just start with an initial state, for instance, like an MPS that is thrown in here, and we do time evolution. So time evolution is then given by a unitary operator, which is non-local. So in here is like a big tensor with all the legs, uh, so all the components uh, needed. So the standard uh, way of proceeding is to discretize the time, so we use some trotterization of your uh, unitary evolution, take small times, uh, small time steps, which still are unitary evolutions, so unitary operators which are non-local, but then each of them can be approximated in a controlled way with something which has this sort of local structure, like MPO structure. So the most common uh, technique, although not the unique one, is using this kind of Suzuki trotter expansion for the unitary evolution. And then, then we are back to the algorithm that I, that I uh, showed at the beginning, that you can apply this kind of thing on an MPS and find the result as an MPS again. So this step is, is called truncation, because uh, when you apply some uh, MPO, typically your one dimension is going to grow. And that's precisely what we were talking about a moment ago. You, you, your result, you have to approximate within the family that you are allowed to keep or what the computer allows. right? So. You do this and then you iterate, and what you have is uh, an approximation to your time evolved state in the form of the chosen uh, tensor network, in this case, an MPS. And then you can compute observables by just, okay, this is the tensor network picture for what an observable looks like. It's just like, like the, the bracket contracting with some operator uh, inside. Okay, what the problem is, is that, okay, uh, the algorithm is clear, we know what to do, but the problem is that if we do that, uh, in, uh, in general, what might happen is that even if we start with an um, uncorrelated state and we evolve with a local Hamiltonian, the entropy might grow very fast. So the entanglement might grow very fast, up to linearly with time. And because our bond dimension only holds a limited entropy, so we will need a larger and larger bond dimension to, to keep up with that. And in terms of the resources that we need, this means that we will need an exponentially large bond dimension as time moves forward. And this limits what we can do with time, standard time evolution algorithms. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we cannot do anything at all. Uh, there's still many physical situations that we can deal with. And this happens both in closed uh, systems where the evolution is unitary, but also in open quantum systems where we might have a, a master equation um, giving us the dynamics. And well, people uh, study this and use that for, for interesting physics. And I'm not going over the results, but there are some reviews uh, which, which actually uh, explore these possibilities in, in detail. But what I want to talk uh, about here is that also classically there are interesting non-equilibrium problems and we can also uh, use these tools to uh, approach them. And um, in particular, uh, the, the kind of problems I'm, I'm thinking about here are stochastic models where the evolution is given by some uh, continuous time uh, Markov uh, process. So the, the probabilities, so this is a classical system. So we have a number of configurations and uh, the, the P vector here describes the probability of each configuration. So this evolution equation tells us how these probabilities evolve. And this is given by a Markov generation, generator, which is a stochastic uh, operator given by side, some transition rates from one configuration to the others and some escape rate. So that it makes it uh, stochastic. 
So what is interesting to look at in here are dynamic observables. For instance, one typical one is the, the activity, which means how many changes of configurations we've had uh, along a certain, a certain trajectory during a certain time. And the natural way of, uh, of uh, analyzing these things is uh, to look at ensembles of trajectories uh, in an analogous way to ensembles of configurations in the thermodynamics. And uh, the, the idea is that if we have some, for instance, equilibrium uh, probability vector, uh, then we still have a dynamical situation where there are uh, transitions happening. Right? So we can start study fluctuations, for instance, of uh, what are uh, dynamical observables, in this case, the activity or something else, depending on the parameters of the problem. So even though the equilibrium might be not so interesting, the dynamics of the around the equilibrium, the fluctuations of these uh, of these um, uh, quantities might be interesting. So, as I said, the natural way to study this is these ensembles of trajectories. And for instance, one can compute expectation values of this activity, but also higher order uh, moments of uh, of this or, or something else, like all of them. And uh, one can, in fact, uh, study what is the probability distribution for having some number of changes in a given uh, amount of time. And this probability distribution um, is uh, in, the, in the limit of long time and uh, large system sizes satisfies a large deviation uh, property. So it can be studied using a rate function, uh, which is a large deviation rate function. And I think you already had a talk uh, by one of the experts in the topic last week. So you probably already know more about this than, uh, than I do. And uh, anyway, an alternative way of studying the same thing is, uh, is uh, looking at the moment generating function, which um, also satisfies a large deviation principle. And the corresponding uh, function is called scale cumulant generating function because it generates the cumulants while the moment generating, while generates the moments of the, of the activity. And an interesting thing is that you can actually compute this, this function as an expectation value, say of, uh, let me see if I can draw something in here for some reason, I cannot point in here. Okay, so you can, you can find this as an as a expectation value, so a matrix element of like the equilibrium uh, property and uh, sort of an evolution operator, which is uh, exponential of time, times a generator, special generator, and then summing overall configurations. This is the flat state, this yes, means summing overall configurations. And uh, this special generator is called tilted generator. And what it does is to add a weight to the changes, which actually are the ones that increase the activity. So every time you, have, every time you induce a change of configuration, you uh, increase the activity, the dynamical activity by one, which counts changes. Uh, counts changes right? Oops. Uh, did I uh, go too fast? I think. Okay. So uh, I think uh, I think I missed one <laughs> expression. Okay. Uh, so what happened? I, I think I lost the equation for some reason, or was it shown? Ah, no, it's here. Okay. Sorry, I didn't see. It. So I just wanted to say that the, the change in the tilted configuration is precisely to add this uh, exponential factor uh, that counts these um, this changes of, of uh, changes of configuration according to this uh, exponential weight. Okay, so the goal then is to find in the long time limit, of course, this expectation value that I, I said will be projected. So acting with e to the t uh, ws on some initial configuration or the equilibrium configuration, uh, it will project onto the, the uh, vector with the largest eigenvalue of this uh, generator. So the goal is to find this one. And, and typically, we're interested in large system sizes. So except for very few cases, you cannot do that exactly. You need some numerics. And if you have this largest eigenvalue, this is actually the same as this um, scale cumulant, cumulant generating function that allows you to access the probability distribution of like the dynamical observable. And uh, well, the trick to do that with uh, tensor hours, or one possible trick, not the only one, is that if the model has detailed balance, then one can uh, apply a similarity transformation that transforms the generator into an Hermitian operator, and then find uh, so the, the like dominant uh, eigenvalue or the change the sign, find the ground state of that 
effective Hamiltonian, and exactly with the algorithms that I was describing at the very beginning. And this is something that uh, we started exploring um, some couple of years ago with uh, Juan Garrahan. And, and you realize that actually these problems, because uh, or many of these problems, because you can have generators which are local and then they, they look very much like spin models, they are very well suited to apply distance order work methods. And this is somehow what I'm telling you in the last uh, few minutes. So, well, the kind of models that we have been studying are, are I mean, uh, there have been different models, but let me just focus on these kinetically constrained models. These are interesting because they, they typically are, well, they are these classical stochastic models that have a sort of not so interesting um, equilibrium, uh, equilibrium distribution. So that one is trivial because it's basically like um, a product of, of uh, individual spins. But what is interesting is that the dynamics uh, is constrained by some, by some special terms so that changes of configuration can only happen uh, under some um, conditions. And this dynamical constraints is what uh, produces that the dynamics is not, uh, is, is very special and shows some kind of slowdown for some parameters and, and some uh, special features because it's not trivial how to reach some configurations from some others. And th there are different models like, uh, like this. So some of the most typical uh, ones or paradigmatic ones are these EAST and FA models. And uh, for instance, in the EAST model, that is the one for which I'm showing results uh, next, you can only flip a spin. For instance, if you, have, uh, you want to flip this second spin here, it can only happen if the left neighbor is up. In that case, you can flip from zero to one or one to zero with some rates that, uh, that sort of control what is the, the uh, say, population in equilibrium. And, and it's equivalent to a temperature in equilibrium, if you want. But if there is a zero in the first spin, then you cannot, you cannot flip. So you always need a, a spin one, so a, a value one, to facilitate the flipping of the next neighbor. And well, there is this FA model too, but I don't have time to go into too much detail, which allows, uh, so can be facilitated from both sides. And of course you can make this uh, like an OR, you can make it a, a XOR, or you can uh, make it an AND, and then you have models that are differently constrained depending on what condition you, you ask for. And this changes the dynamics actually, and the, the like portions of the Hilbert space that are connected to each other. So what I'm showing down here is actually the concentration in equilibrium that as I said, is, is uh, dominated by, so it's controlled by this single parameter in here. And well, these models are interesting because they are known to have a dynamical uh, phase transition between a regime where, uh, which is active and, and there is a lot of transitions in the trajectories and a regime which is inactive where this slows down uh, dramatically. And this is shown, so it's been demonstrated to, the, or they have been demonstrated, these both models that I was showing, to have a first order phase transition. And this uh, reflects in, a, in the behavior of this uh, scaling cumul scale uh, cumulant uh, generating function that I said can be written as a, as a ground state problem for our tensor network uh, algorithms. So I'm not really going too much into the detail of the, what is known uh, about these models. A lot has been studied about this uh, from with other classical means. And what I just want to show you is what happens when you look at it for the tensor network tool. So what, do you, what, what can you look at and what can you see with this method? So you can just find ground states in this case for the corresponding Hamiltonian to these models. And this Hamiltonian is just a local spin Hamiltonian, which has some, yeah, it's not that different from, a, from an easing, uh, quantum missing is in model, but it's of course not the same because some term just encodes this kind of, of constraint that only flips if one of the, so there's a projector, not just a, a sigma matrix. But anyway, um, numerically you, so, or, or in practice you do the same thing, you search for the ground state for different system sizes and different parameters. And uh, for instance, this plot in here shows exactly this uh, scale, uh, cumulant generating function, which is the ground state energy or minus the ground state energy, depending on how you define it, and, uh, and how it works for different system sizes. And you can reach system sizes up to 400, which of course is much larger than you would do with uh, any of the other classical methods. And, and the phase transition you can see here in an abrupt change in this, in this energy. You can locate this very precisely using the results from, from your uh, optimization and locate where the transition is. And then you can study 
where the so how this uh, position of the transition scales with system size. And you can see this also in the dynamical activity that is a first order phase transition. So you can see an abrupt jump uh, in the dynamical phase transition. Of course, it becomes more and more visible when your system size goes to larger systems. You can also go to the second derivative and see the peak in the susceptibility and determine this with a lot of precision. And well, if you change the concentration in the equilibrium, this is like the easiest case. You can make it much smaller and then things become more difficult. You see that everything shifts and, and uh, it becomes, a, a, say, uh, a bit more uh, challenging, but still you can locate it if you do large enough system sizes. The idea is that in here, maybe with a small system size already doing exact analysis, you would get a good, uh, a good guess of where the transition is happening and so on. While uh, in this case, well, you really need to go to much larger systems to get something comparable. You can also compute the large deviation rate function, which is related to this uh, uh, scale uh, cumulative function by a Lian transformation. And well, you can just plot it and then uh, say you can compare here with a Poissonian or Gaussian distribution. And what, what you see here, this flattening is actually the signature of having this kind of, of phase transition. And well, again, you can explore how it depends on the on the parameters. I don't want to uh, show you too much about the details. You can you can see all these calculations uh, how they are done in in the paper. And we did this for other models too. Uh, more recently, you can actually I don't know why this is flying here. So one thing that you can do with this method that you cannot do with others is that at the end you have the ground state, right? So you have a, an MPS that gives you precisely what is this uh, probability distribution. And then you can explore the structure. And with this structure in the in the region of uh, so in the active region, but close to the yeah, close to the phase transition, is non-trivial. So it's, pre it's predicted to have some special uh, special structures or some special non-translational invariant distribution of the concentrations side by side. And you can actually see this if you uh, plot what is the, the uh, say population side by side, you can see these periodic structures uh, appearing and you can study them and, and so on. You can see the different non-trivial, so these are just a small system sizes to see the plot, but of course you can do this for larger system sizes. Uh, this is not the only thing that you can do. So let me just tell you two minutes and then I'll, I'll just go to the conclusions about something else that you can do uh, with this. You can, so uh, all these things that I was saying was about finding the ground state and, and uh, and say this is scale uh, cumulant generating function. But maybe what one wants is to uh, produce trajectories that correspond to this, uh, to this tilted generator so that, that are rare trajectories because they have like more activity or less activity than what is typical. And this is very difficult if you just use a um, uh, normal sampling of the of each sample according to the true dynamics because they are rare, the trajectories, right? So they, want, uh, they will take very long to appear. And this becomes even worse with system size. And uh, so if we want to, to sample trajectories according to this tilted generator, this omega s, this is not a stochastic generator. So you cannot really use it directly. But you would like to have trajectories that correspond to this e to the minus s k weight that, that, uh, that corresponds to the, to the tilted generator. So it turns out that this has been uh, studied. And, and people have proposed uh, stochastic that, uh, generators that generate dynamics according to these weights. And the best, uh, the best uh, one uh, known, the optimal one, is, is called dupe generator or uh, dupe dynamics. So this, this what I'm showing here is just recalling the tilted generator. And, and this has, as I said, the like eigenvalue is theta s, and it has some eigenvectors. And this we can find with tensor network methods. The dupe generator is constructed from that one. And uh, by applying some similarity transformation, which is a diagonal matrix uh, where the, the elements in the diagonal are actually the components of the left dominant eigenvector. So if you have a way to compute the dominant eigenvector, in principle, you, can, you have a way also to construct precisely this generator. And well, it, uh, it boils down to transforming the transition rate to something that, is, uh, that has a prefactor that, that is a rate between uh, the components of different, uh, different configurations in this dominant eigenvector. And well, the, the uh, escape rate is shifted simply by, by the dominant eigenvalue. Uh, 
So we, from the calculations that I was describing before, we actually have these ingredients. And actually, you can just uh, use it to compute expectation values of observables directly in the tilted ensemble. So this would mean computing expectation values, so averaging over all the, all the possible trajectories uh, with a weight that goes with the activity that is determined by the activity. This would be precisely the weights that the tilted ensemble uh, do. So that's what this means. And uh, it turns out that it can be computed with this uh, modified generator that I was showing before, with just a prefactor, which is, it just depends on the initial and final point. So it's not really something that scales with, with time. So there is no exponential factor anymore. And, and this is why it's advantageous to, to try to uh, sample according to this generator. So using the MPS approximation, we can actually do that. And I'm not showing the details, just saying that what we do is continuous time Monte Carlo where you can compute all these transition rates and you can compute the escape rates. And then you can just, uh, just to finish, show you some example. So it's the same model, it's the same dynamical activity. And here, uh, this was done by Luke Kauser, the student of, of uh, Juan. And, uh, and you can see a comparison. I mean, it's also close that you cannot really see the difference. There is a dashed line that is really the, the activity for different values of this S parameter computed with a precise, um, say, precise variational search. And then uh, the other points actually come from performing the sampling for the tilted ensemble at the uh, corresponding value of the parameter and, and then averaging, so computing the, the expectation value. And you can see that even for very small bond dimension, the results are very close. And uh, actually, uh, this is just to show that, that, this, that this works even with a with a bond dimension that is not very large, it can be corrected uh, with some important sampling techniques. But I mean, you can actually see a more graphical example on the right, where you can see an example of a trajectory sample either from very far in the, in the active region or very far in the inactive region. You can see here, so this would be time in the horizontal direction, while here you have the spatial direction and the black uh, points are ones and the, the whites are zeros. You can see, the difference, so I mean, graphically, the, the difference between the typical trajectories in, in different values of the, of the tilted um, ensemble. Well, and as I said, this works even with very small bond dimension where you can use some, uh, some uh, tricks to, oops, sorry, okay, to, to correct for, for the errors in principle. And I'm just jumping to the conclusions because uh, I only want had one more extra slide, but it doesn't really matter. So just uh, to, to finish, uh, the message here is, okay, we know very well that the sonar works work very well, and uh, many of the reasons why for quantum systems, but they also work for uh, classical problems. So there's a lot of things that one can explore with these tools where these uh, allow us to go to larger systems. And well, I showed you these details about phase transitions and how they scale. You can explore correlations, you can compute entropy. So things that with other more typical methods for these problems, maybe it's not so easy, but even sampling of these rare trajectories is some new uh, use of these transformer work tools that allow us to do something, something different. And well, finite times, I didn't show you the results, but actually all this that I showed was in the long time limit, but you can also do the same thing for finite time. So you fix a finite time, then you can still use all these tools to explore that. And there is another thing that I didn't show, but uh, that goes back to the quantum <laughs> to the quantum world for these models, which is that actually these Hamiltonians that appear here as uh, connected with these, uh, these tilted generators, well, they are Hamiltonians, so one can then look at them as quantum Hamiltonians because they are quantum Hamiltonians, they have non-commuting terms, and that's what is the dynamics in them. So we know that the ground state properties encode a lot of these classical models, but there is a whole lot of spectrum about that. And uh, already from 2015, some uh, early work by, by Juan and, and his co-workers, they showed that there was evidence for some slow dynamics also in the quantum regime that, that repeats somehow some of the patterns of these of this constrained dynamics, but it's different because it, in this case it's really quantum and it has all the spectrum. And we retook this later also with Juan and Nicola Pancotti, a student in, who was a student in our group then, and, and since then he graduated, of course. And uh, actually, we, we show that there are a lot of properties, uh, interesting properties in this kind of quantum Hamiltonians. There is this localization, slow dynamics. You can even prove some things mathematically. And it gives you, uh, actually suggests a whole set of models where this uh, non-trivial uh, dynamics could be interesting also from the quantum uh, side. 
And this is also, thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, I went a bit over time. Thanks a lot. In fact, we started five minutes later, so okay. we didn't go over time at all. Um, I'm going to uh, ask the, the audience for questions, perhaps someone. If you have a question, just unmute and ask away. Well, uh, if I may, so can you comment uh, on the kind of entanglement properties of these uh, NPSs that you have been looking into? So you always, uh, is there like a corresponding area also in these cases then, or how is it? Yes, yeah. actually, uh, yeah, I don't have the plots in here, I think, unfortunately. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, we looked into the entropy of these uh, of these uh, models, and actually, for this uh, particular case that I was showing in here, uh, they are not very entangled, so the entropy is never very mm. very big. It increases towards the phase transition, not so surprisingly. Maybe although it's a first order phase transition, so it doesn't really need to be the case. I think um, a problem rather than the entanglement of the true ground state might be that also the density of states might be funny for some of these parameters. So when the when the concentration in the equilibrium is very, very low, which is like very low temperature, then is when things get harder. I think they get harder rather because of the spectrum of the of the Hamiltonian. But uh, the entropy, as far as we have seen, I mean, we don't have a, a, an exact result, but uh, it's bounded. Even rainy entropies are bounded. So that, that all points to the direction that at least for these models, the NPS is a good approximation in all cases. Um, yeah, I mean, in the limit of very large S, I think like very inactive, then you have an exact uh, NPS. In the limit of very active one, you have something which is not exact, but it's very small one dimension. So even if like mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of sites, like one dimension 10 or something like this. So although we don't have an explicit expression, mm -hmm. uh, probably we were not uh, smart enough or persistent enough to find it. Mm, in the middle, we don't have an exact result, but we observe that the entropy is pretty small. So yeah, and, and well, it's a first order phase mm -hmm. transition, as I was saying. So maybe this model is special for that. And for some other models, you will also have uh, more entanglement. At the end, you are looking at a, at a local Hamiltonian, right? So it's really the constraints mm -hmm. that change the structure of the of the Hilbert space. So in this uh, particular cases, it's not very it's not broken in small pieces. You have other constraint models where you fragment the Hilbert space, right? And that gives you some other properties. And maybe in those cases, you will have something which is more difficult to capture directly with the MPS. I don't know, but it could happen. I might want to uh, right. ask. Ask something thanks else. A also, sort of thanks a lot for the nice talk, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. If I can ask quickly as a follow up or related to Philip's mm -hmm. question, uh, uh, I can understand that if you are, have this model with a detailed balance and you can map to the to a Hamiltonian, you really have mm -hmm. sort of all the quantum variation mm -hmm. tools to your uh, uh, yeah advantage. But um, if you are simply representing, let's say, the probability distribution itself as an MPS, uh, then I cannot imagine sort of computing entanglement entropies, but you have to think about another sort of uh, information measure, maybe mutual information, or, or how, how does that work? Yes, no, absolutely. I mean, so there are two ways of looking at that, right? So you can think of, uh, you want to know about entropy with a like uh, standard definition of entropy, and then that might be difficult to compute because you might be thinking that you have an operator, or you can look at mathematically the analogous quantity to the entanglement entropy, which means how, I mean, it's a measure of correlations between one part of the system and the other, right? But of course it doesn't necessarily correspond as you are very well saying to uh, an entropy in, in the physical sense. Uh, but, but mathematically, it does tell us whether the MPS is a good approximation or not. And this yeah. we do uh, like 
so routinely for operators too, for metrics product operators or thermal states or things that we, well, thermal states are yeah, special. Can you imagine taking the MPS and you break it into two parts and you look at the entropy between. Exactly. The so you can, cut, but, uh, exactly. You can always take, okay, let's take the singular value decomposition. So the Schmidt decomposition in the quantum language, but it's just a singular value decomposition. Measure how much uh, entanglement in this sense uh, you have between one part yeah. and the other. So this is measuring correlations. So it's a valid method of the correlations of your state in any vector space. The only questionable thing is whether you can call this entanglement or not. But, and yeah. you can say it's some kind of entanglement, but it's some Is kind of correlation. Information or something between. I mean, you could look at uh, anything else. Of course, you can define analog analogous quantities of mutual. If you do it that way, in this case, it's not different because you just have a vector. So you have like a vector is like a pure state, and this quantity that would, would be computed would reduce to the to the same one. Uh, but but you might think of uh, trying to compute uh, entropies in in a more standard way. Um, and some of them, I mean, I don't have them now in, uh, in my head, but some of them might turn out to be difficult if you need to diagonalize uh, something or to explore the exponentially many components of your of your. Yeah. Uh, probability distribution, but some of them can be approximated anyway. So that's that, there, you could be able to compute other, other quantities for sure. The only thing that you cannot do, of course, and this is it's true, is call this thing, this is the entanglement in your system, but it's some kind of, I mean, uh, people call it entanglement because I think it's a descriptive name, but one has to take this in, in, into account that it's not a physical entanglement, you're right, it's a classical system. Thanks, I see a question back later. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, thanks for a very interesting and intriguing uh, talk. I mean, uh, there was a lot of information to, uh, to park, so I, I, I barely uh, could follow, basically. But uh, um, no, I was interested, in, the, in especially in the last part of the, uh, the talk, where you actually talked about the, the rare trajectories. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, so can you say a little bit more about this, this dupe uh, um, uh, dynamics and how it's being constructed? Because it seems to me that if you tilt an, an ensemble, uh, that by definition almost uh, you uh, you skew the dynamics such mm -hmm. that uh, you end up with the wrong, uh, well, the wrong dynamics actually. So, so how do you do this? So this is this is for me a, a little bit of a mystery to be honest. Yes, no, actually you want the wrong dynamics. That's somehow the the idea in here that you want to sample uh, trajectories with this weight. Uh, okay, let me see. Yes, with this weight that, uh, so you want to sample observables with this extra weight, I think uh, I had it in the next slide, but yeah. uh, you want to compute this kind of averages. Right. Right, so this extra factor is what the, in your tilted generator you get with this tilting precisely. So you would like to, to construct your ensemble such that your, your trajectories have this uh, tilted, uh, probability to appear, to be able to compute these expectation values so that you are able to, uh, because I mean, you could, what you could do is, of course, you uh, say, mm, generate trajectories according to, to your normal uh, dynamics, but then uh, trajectories that have a, like a large activity won't appear, will appear exponentially uh, less, say. And, um, and what you want is precisely to trick your generator into generating dynamics according to this special way, precisely this one. Okay, but may, may I, uh, if I understand it correctly, you do some sort of a, um, a, a need a reweighting scheme. Eh? So you just say I am uh, uh, skewing my dynamics with this e to the minus s, and then I correct for it using the right uh, the right probability distribution that I really want to observe, and that is of course this uh, this tilted ensemble. Is that, is that how you think about it? Because no, I mean, no, I would say that the tilted ensemble is giving you this this uh, e to the minus s k that you really want, and the problem is to generate that with a stochastic dynamics because your true dynamics doesn't give you that, right? And the tilted generator is not a stochastic, so the dupe generator does that for you. It's a stochastic generator. This there's one that is written in here. But the way it works is by changing the transition rates from the ones in the tilted generator to something that has this prefactor, <laughs> this, yeah. this uh, factor in front. And now what I'm saying is that in practice, 
these, these um, transition rates are something local that you can compute uh, efficiently and easily. And uh, what, what the new technique gives you is that you can actually estimate these ones very well. So the reweighting that I was mentioning was about not having this exactly because at the end what we have is an, approximate, is an approximation to them. Hmm. So then you can correct for that, doing some kind of important something again, where you take into account how much your, your uh, say, transition rates or, or escape rates are different from like the true ones, which will be these ones. Now, it seems, uh, to me, it seems a bit magical because, of course, in, in general, especially if, if you go to, uh, to complex systems, this is, this is going to be extremely hard. Eh? So, I mean, okay, maybe I should just study these, these papers a little bit more in detail, but I, 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 I really think that this is sort of a, a magical recipe for enhancing uh, uh, the dynamics, apparently. I, I think, yeah, I think it is sort of a magical uh, recipe. The magical uh -huh. recipe is, is actually this Duke generator that people no, uh, came same, up yeah. with. Yeah, yeah, for me too. Uh, but it's, it's sort of, it, it does the trick because this, this is actually a mathematical result and it's actually written in the, in the paper step by step. So you can okay. just follow it and, and see that it's actually like that, that if you generate uh, according to this, which is a stochastic generator, and you uh, average over the trajectories that come uh, out from that in the long time limit, uh, then you only have a factor that doesn't depend on time or activity mm. anymore. It's just some two components of your of your equilibrium state or, or your say dominant vector. Yeah. And, and usually the problem is that it's not easy to know who this guy is or to use it efficiently to, to generate dynamics. And this is where the, the fact that it is written as a tensor network, as a matrix product state, helps because then you can do everything, every step in this computation in an efficient manner, everything. So every step in the sampling scales at most as a, as a system size and, and then you can do it. Okay. Yeah, so related to that, now you mentioned the tensor networks, of course. So uh, that's the, the major part of your, your mm -hmm. presentation. So uh, I mean, the applications you showed were ma mainly for, uh, for spin models and, mm -hmm. and, and like. And these are, of course, very important. But can you also uh, extend them to uh, continuous models and uh, and and um, say atomic models or? Uh, yes, models? I mean there are many things that you can do with them. So typically, for the uh, so what you would need is that your individual systems have finite dimension. But even if they are bosons, there are many tricks to to deal also with bosonic systems. And actually in the last years, uh, we and many other people have been working on applying this, for instance, to lattice gauge theories and taking continuum limits and then finding uh, results for, for field theories in the continuum using these techniques as a com computational trick. So uh, at the end, in these cases, you, you go through discretizing the model and writing it as a spin, uh, spin model or spin plus bosons model and then taking uh, appropriate limits. But uh, yeah, the, the uh, restriction is that the physical dimension, so the, the basis for each of your systems has to be finite. But it doesn't, uh, it doesn't need to be exactly finite. Finite, it might be uh, infinite, but, but uh, for the states that you are uh, worried about, not all the states are occupied. So a truncation is very, is very suitable in that case. And then you can always, use it too. And uh, as the continuum, there is also versions for continuum uh, matrix product states and continuum pairs and, and some other tensor networks that work directly in the continuum, not in a lattice, but those use different algorithms. So uh, although they share the, the idea of these uh, parametrizations and so on, that would be a different, a different family, but they also exist. So you can also uh, okay. use them for that. Oh, thanks for your clarification. Thanks very much. Thank you. Do you have any further questions? Um, maybe I can ask something about, uh, so if, if you have this uh, non-equilibrium dynamics uh, situation, but uh, without, uh, for f let's say for the model, it doesn't satisfy detail balance. So you, mm -hmm. will, you will not have this map to a uh, Hermitian matrix. Um, That's, yeah, that's not fundamental, actually. Uh, we, uh, it's something that we want to explore further uh, because, no, I don't think I have it here, or do I? 
yes, maybe here. Yeah, this is something that I didn't show, but I'm, I'm not going to explain that. But somehow the, the key expressions have something like this. So even uh, at this point, you don't need the hermeticity. So you can work in principle also with this, uh, with the tilted generator directly. Right. Yeah. And, and this also fits within the tensor network scheme. So in principle, many of the things you would be able to do, and, and you could just find what is the, the dominant eigenvector by iterating this kind of evolution and seeing to, to what it converges. And I would expect that it also gives you a good answer if you are in cases like I showed before, where the but, MPS is actually a good approximation. But if your if your Markov chain has, uh, for instance, many absorbing states, mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't your leading eigenvector always be zero? Oh, sorry, I mean, wouldn't you? Would the, the leading eigenvalue always be zero? Because you... I mean, the, uh, why, why zero so... Uh, because at, at, well, at late times, you will end up in an observing state, for sure. It's, well, this is uh, actually, this is a tilted generator, right? Uh, yeah. Not... Uh, not the original uh, stochastic generator. Mm. But, uh, but what I'm saying is that, okay, I, I don't know, I haven't thought of the problem too much. And I, as I said, it's something that we wanted to explore a bit, uh, a bit better. But in principle, you could just simulate the dynamics, right? Either with the tilted generator or, or with even the, the original uh, generator. Yeah, okay. and, uh, and then you can explore, I mean, finite time or, or something else. Uh, whatever you want in principle without needing that it is admission. Yeah. I don't know if, this, if, if there are other limitations that would appear. That's, that's a good question that, that at some point we would like to also explore a little, a little bit more, more. That's cool. All right. Uh, if there are no further questions, then maybe we can thank Mari Carmen again. And then, uh... Thank you very much.